Welcome to another edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast. John Schmoke with you. Today, we're going to be joined by Chris Bizignano. He's from the Giants Insider Podcast and Newspaper. The Giants Huddle Podcast is brought to you by PSENG. Energy efficiency for game time and anytime. Visit PSEG, PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. Chris, this is the second time I've talked to you probably in the last nine months or so. Uh, so you at the facility yesterday. Yeah. How's everything going, man? How are you? Good, man. I'm doing, yeah, hey, look, we're all getting ready for this big one Sunday night. <clears throat> I think we're all kind of excited. Uh, doing great. How are you doing? Uh, you know, hey, look, it's been some rough times lately around the building, but here we are Sunday night in a big one in prime time, John. You couldn't ask for more. Yeah, and I figured the way we'll do this, why don't we start with that? We'll talk about the game a little bit, then we'll kind of talk some uh, big picture stuff in terms of what you're thinking about offseason and just kind of where the state of the franchise is. So, Chris, what's your big takeaway from the game two weeks ago and the impact of just, you know, playing this team, you know, just for the, for the Giants one game ago and, and for Washington, they haven't played a game since these two teams met. How do you kind of put that all up into your uh, analysis for how this might go on Sunday night? I think you're going to see a lot of the same stuff, John. It's going to be a tough, close battle. You know, that mistakes are going to probably cost you a game. And uh, obviously last time it ended in a tie, but, Hey, the Giants could have put it away. Big penalty, right? Uh, kind of negated that. And then they had a situation where they had Tyler, uh, Taylor Heineke in the fourth and short. And, you know, T- Taylor rolls was left. He comes up with a big hit to Curtis Samuel on a little improv route. The Giants don't plaster up on him. Giants stop him there. The game's over. You know, so it's going to come down. These, these are two teams that kind of like, like to do the same thing. And it's going to come down to execution. Who makes the, the fewest mistakes, turnovers and all that. And that's what you're going to see again Sunday night, man. It can't, it can't get much closer to what happened last time, John. <laughs> 2020, you leave there. And you know, John, it's a weird feeling because I actually, I popped in the, in the Washington locker room after the game, obviously <clears throat> after the Giants. And both locker rooms were the same, same feeling. They, they both felt like they lost the game. It was a weird feeling, John. You were there, right? It was a weird feeling. Uh, the Giants had a feeling. You talk to players like, man, you know, okay, we tied, but they had, a, they were looking around like, did we lose this game? And then I popped over to Washington really quick. And Ron Rivera, you could, you know, you could feel the same thing. So this is a little bit of like, okay, let's let's get back at it here, and we have a little score to settle because uh, we don't like the way this one finished up two weeks ago. Yeah, I think both teams definitely feel the same way. I'm with you, and I think you hit it. You know. People say, oh, well, you know, which team makes the most plays? And I think for me, Chris, it's which team is going to make the fewest mistakes, right? And, you know, Taylor Heineke, you look at his turnover numbers this year, they're not bad. But if you watch the games, there are opportunities every game for teams to turn him over. And I think it's essential for the Giants to take advantage of those opportunities this weekend when they present themselves. When you can get that interception, go and get it. You know, this is not, you know, Dak Prescott. This is not. You know, Jalen Hurts, you know, this is a guy, while he can make some plays and he's sneaky and, you know, he's got some moxie, you can turn Taylor Heineke over. And I think when they get those shots this Sunday night, the Giants have to take advantage if they want to win this game. Because I think points are going to be hard to come by. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, John, because, you know, Taylor Heineke gives them a little, you know, he gives them a little it factor, no question about it. You know, they, they like playing behind him, but there is every game Taylor plays in, he's going to give you a few opportunities. There's no question about it. And he's going to throw some balls up. They're going to be like, well, well, that's why he's been a career backup, you know, because, you know, you have to take advantage of that. You know, there's no question. Look, I felt the loss of McKinney and Dory was huge the last time they played them. You know, huge. And, and they're not going to have him this week either. So, but that doesn't mean other guys like the Nick McClouds and the Fever Moreau's and those guys, they're going to have to step up, John. Look, the bottom line, John, with this team, they have to play better. They have to play better football. They have to run the ball better. They have to stop the run better. Okay, you have to play better in the back end. Hey, John, the biggest thing last game, too, was, was what? Tackling in the back end. Terry McClellan catches a little, uh, a little pass in the flat. Fabian misses the tackle. Terry walks in, easy touchdown. Okay, Jahan Dotson, he catches a ball over the middle, two missed tackles. Can't have that this game because these guys can't hurt you. They have receivers. So you have to play better. That's the main thing. Just play better football, dude. Yeah, and I think not having a Dory Jackson back this week is going to hurt again because you don't have anyone that can cover Terry McLaurin. You know, I think if Terry McLaurin's on another team, he's talked about the same way we're talking about, you know, Stefan Diggs and Justin Jefferson. I think he's that, you know, I know Jefferson's having like an all whatever season, but I think he's in that category. He's that good of a player. 
So I think when you take a look at it, the Giants are going to have to figure out how to match up with them. Is it going to be Moreau? Is it going to be McLeod? Are they going to zone him more? So that to me is, is a big deal here because he's, you know, they have other guys. Dotson's good. Samuel's good. But McLaurin's the guy that can really wreck the game. And that's the guy Heineke always looks to in, in, in a lot of these big spots. So how the Giants adjust yeah. and try to match mm-hmm. up with him, I think, is going to be pretty telling. That's going to be one of the keys of the game because, like you said, John, when Taylor, who's he looking for in that big third down situation? He's looking for Terry McLaurin. You know, that's who he's looking for, man. That's his guy, you know, and he's he's shown that, you know, since he's taken over for Wentz, man. McLaurin, they've gotten McLaurin involved since Wentz has been out. And Taylor, that's this guy. That's who he's going to look for. So, like you said, how the Giants going to play him? You know, look, Wink is a man up guy, man. We know that, right? But he's going to have to mix it up. He did a few times last time, but. You know, John, like you said, he, Terry McLaurin is a guy. Am I going to put him in JJ's class and like that? No, not yet. But I tell you what, man, he's just a step below those guys. That's how good he is. And like you said, if he had a if he had a top flight quarterback, a lot of people, a lot more people, be talking about this guy, man, because this guy is real, real good. Yeah, and you talk about Wink doing stuff, and I think, <clears throat> you know, we talk about how Ojolari had a, had a sack in that game. Uh, Thibodeau had a sack in that game. And I think those are two actually. Yeah. And I think the way Wink set them up, I think was key. You know, you look back, their sacks didn't come on one-on-one pass rushes versus offensive tackles, right? Wink's pre-snap formation set up free right. runners. They set up one-on-one opportunities with tight ends. They set up one-on-one opportunities with guards. And I'm curious to see if he can do that again, or if Washington now having seen that, is going to be able to make some adjustments and it's not going to be quite as easy for the pass rush. Yeah, well, you know, Wink is going to mix it up. That that's what he does. And you know what? Let's let's remember that, you know, they had 11 games of tape before they played the Giants. Yep. So they know what Wink likes to do. But the thing with Wink is, John, is that okay, that's nice you have 11 12 games of tape. But guess what? I'm going to throw another wrinkle in here. And that that Thibodeau sack was a prime example. They didn't know where to slide over. You know, Thibodeau was left to a free rush to Taylor Heineke. And to me, John, it was amazing that Taylor even held on to that ball because Tibbs really stuck him good, you know. But that, even that, that Charles Leno got confused in that coverage. Yep. You know, so it's it, w- 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 if you remember, Leno didn't slide. He was too late sliding over to Thibodeau. Boom, Thibodeau has the free rush. So no matter how much tape you have on Wink, he's going to throw a wrinkle in where maybe you didn't see. Or he's going to throw something up front where it's still going to confuse a quarterback or a slide protection, whatever it might be. And that's going to be, look, that's going to be one of the keys. Can Wink do that? Because if they don't get pressure up front, they're in for a long day. I mean, you know, Taylor Heineke, you know, even though he was a career backup and all that, but he still can hurt you, man. If he's going to sit back in that pocket, he's going to, with those guys running in the second day, they have two good receivers, one excellent. Samuel's a good two. And of course, the kid Dotson is an up-and-coming, man. These guys are going to hurt you, man. So that's going to be one of the keys of the game, no question about it. Yeah, look, you got to get him into situations, too, where you can unleash Wink stuff, right? So you got to get him in the second and tens. You got to get him the third and tens. And one of the problems is that the Giants, once again in that game two weeks ago, did not stop the run. You know, Brian Robinson didn't have a bunch of 20- or 30-yard gains, but he had in the five-yard gains, six-yard gains, seven-yard gains, eight-yard gains, where they weren't in those, you know, third and long, second and long situations where Wink can kind of get really creative. And I think that's kind of been a theme this season, Chris, where the Giants have not been able to stop the run on early downs. If Leonard Williams is back, I think both of us probably feel yeah. pretty good about that. That'll pro- that'll help in, in that circumstance for sure. But the issues have been on the edges. You know, can can the Giants, you know, guard and out do a better job of slowing down Robinson and Antonio Gibson to a, to a lesser extent to let Wink get into that creative stuff, which can turn the the – you know, Heineke passes in the turnovers. That's what Washington wants to do to you, John. You know, they want to get you those third and shorts. I mean, you saw in the Eagle game. That's what they did to the Eagles weeks ago when they beat them. It was Brian Robinson, Brian Robinson, Little Gibson, third and two, third and three. You know, that's what they want to do. They don't, you know, they don't hide what they are as a football team. They're going to come out and they're going to run at you and they're going to try to get in those third and shorts. You know, then they're going to try to hit you with the McLaurins. This is what they are. And, you know, it's, it's a tough matchup for the Giants, like you said, John, because the Giants are just not playing the run well. They're not. They, you know, they're not consistently stopping the run. You know, in the second half last week, I mean, it was 
it was insane. I mean, Miles Sanders, I, mean, I think I could have gained 100 yards with some of the holes <laughs> that Miles had last week against the Giants. You know, So they're just not playing the run well. And, and that's, you know, if that continues, you know, and they're going to come out and they're going to try to establish that run. That's what Washington does. That's what Scott Turner wants to do. And if the Giants can't stay out of those third and shorts, this is going to be a long day. They're going to have to get in those third and six plus to, like you said, to let Wink die, you know. Uh, because let's face it, you know, if, if those in the back end, the cover guys the Giants have right now, it's just not fair. It's just not fair. You know, you're asking a lot out of guys that was signed. I wasn't even on a roster beginning, you know, like Nick McLeod, just stuff like that. You're asking a lot. Cordell Flott, the rookie Flott. You know, guys, and, I, you know, let, let Zion Gilbert's off the practice squad, you know. Yeah. coming And, and uh, look, Donnie Holmes coming back this week, he, that'll, that'll help. Okay, that'll help. No question about it. But they're still they're thin on the back end, man. The, the Adoree loss is huge. Yeah, and, you know, Holmes wasn't there two weeks ago, Chris, to your point. And yeah, yeah. he yeah. probably would have been the guy in Curtis Samuel on that play on that fourth and four where, you know, Heineke rolls out. He comes with him. He runs that little skinny post with a little in deep in route, I think. And then he kind of pivots, whips out back to the outside and Heineke hits him for that big first down. And if Holmes is on him on that play, maybe he's not so open. It was a great play by Heineke, but, you know, hopefully he can make some type of a difference because right now the Giants need as many guys in the secondary as they can get, Chris. They just don't have a lot of bodies and healthy bodies. I mean, against the the – Washington two weeks ago, the only starter out there was Julian Love. I mean, like, that was it. I mean, we got, you know, they got Fabian Moreau back and they got other guys back, but they were really running out just Julian Love and a bunch of guys. And, you know, I, I know the Washington is not a high powered offense, but that's, that's always just going to be really tough. Oh, absolutely, John. Uh, John, you're asking a lot from guys that, you know, you didn't expect to be. In there, let's face it, right? I mean, you, you didn't expect it. No, it. Even Fabian Moreau, Johnny, I mean, he wasn't a starter. You know, they got him. You know, they signed him and they brought him in with injuries and stuff like that. So After cuts, you know, yeah. Asking a lot. After cuts, you brought him in. I mean, mm -hmm. so you were asking a lot, you know. Um, I think people, look, I think a lot of people are forgetting that at times that, hey, look, look at these guys. They got in a back. Like you said, Julian Love is the only starter. You know, he's the only starter. And, you know, so you have to improvise other ways and, 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 and no matter even all that, Wink has done a great job. And here's the key too, John. This is what the this is why the Giants were winning games early in the year. Yeah, they were giving up yards. Yeah, they're 26, 25th in defense. We all know that, right, John? But what were they doing? They were keeping teams out of the end zone. Their third down defense and red zone defense is excellence, top 10. That's what they that's what they do. That's why they were winning games. Keep it close, and they were winning games at the end. So you can't like and then the last few games, two out of the last three games, the red zone hasn't been as good. The Derek down what hasn't been as good. They lose games. That's so they have to get back to that. That's going to be a key. Getting off the field, red zone. That's what they've been doing all year. That's why they kept games close. That's why they held teams to field goals and they won games at the end of the game. So if Washington gets touchdowns in the red zone, if they go two for three and all that, it's going to be a very difficult task, man. It's going to be a difficult, difficult task for this team. Yeah, I want to circle back to big picture defense stuff. Let's let's flip in the game though. Let's yeah. flip to the other side of the ball here, Chris. Giants offense. Yeah. Look, we we know what the issues are on the offensive side of the ball, right? Um, they just don't have the weapons mm -hmm. outside to make teams pay. So when you take a look at what the Giants might want to do offensively in the game, and frankly, I think this is going to be an even lower scoring game than the first matchup. I could see this being like a 13-10. 10 9, 10 7 barn burner type of game here. And, you know, <laughs> the Giants offense did well in the first half, right? In the first matchup, but then they really got yes, they nothing did. done after that. Does that carry over here? Can Kafka and, and, and Dable come up with some stuff to, to get the offense going again early? Has Washington kind of seen what they do and now they can figure it out? How do you view the, the Giants offense versus Washington's defense in this matchup? Yeah, it's going to be mono. Look, I, I think Kafka and Dable, they're going to come in. They're going to try to run that ball again. I think Daniel's going to be a big part of this again. I said that before the last game, John, on the podcast. I said I think Daniel's leg is going to be a huge part because I saw what Marcus Mariota did to them the week before on those zone reads. He hurt them, okay? So I said, okay, Daniel, we got to get Daniel. Daniel's going to be a big part. And he was. He, what did he run for, 60-plus yards, if I remember right, John, or 70 yards, whatever yep. it was? Uh, Saquon had 60-plus. But he ran the ball pretty well second half a little bit of a different story but you know look Saquon's going in this one he's healthy he's off the he's off the injured list you know we, we all know we had a little neck issue he's kind of admitted it was a little bit of a stinger going on and all that stuff so he looks like he wasn't even on a list yet. so he's healthy Daniel's gonna be 
a big part of this. You know, um, can the Gary Brightwell mix in there? Can he be a big part of this? But the Giants are going to come out and they're going to try to run the ball. But now, I tell you what, John, a little bit, I, and I'm not going to say an X factor, but a little, a guy here that could really help this team might be the difference, a little bit more of a difference. And even, he even came up with a big play, that Isaiah Hodgins. I really like the way he's progressing in his offense. John, I don't know if you saw it last game. He totally beat James Bradbury on a double move. A couple. Honestly, he, he 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 beat him once. Slayton beat him once. And Marcus Johnson beat him once. All three guys had double moves that they couldn't get to because the protection wasn't good enough. Right. I like the way he's progressing. I think, look, the last game against Washington, he does a nice little whip route in the end zone. He beats the rookie over there for the touchdown. Okay? So – can he be a little bit more of a factor in this game? You kind of like the way he's – yeah, maybe that could be a little bit of an X factor. Maybe he could get Isaiah Hunt. But, he, look, the whole story is, John, as usual, it's like you got to give Daniel time. Is he going to get somewhat time with these guys up front? I don't know. I mean, you know, he was sacked, what, four times against the last time. Payne came up with a big sack, if I remember right, you know, towards the end of the game and all that. Um, but they're going to – look, they're going to have to – what are the Giants, John? They have to run the ball. They yeah. have to run the ball. That's going to come on and wing it all over the lot, and that's how they're going to beat you. So if they can't establish the run, okay, they're in for a long day. Let's face it. This is no magic formula with the Giants. Kafka and Dave will know they, got, they have to run the ball. Is this going to be another 25-day Barkley plus day? I don't know. We'll see. But him and Daniel are the keys, man. They, they have to run the ball successfully against these guys that have a chance. Yeah, Daniel was 12 for 71 in that last game, Chris. And, you know, Saquon was 18 right. for 63. And – <clears throat> you know, I think those numbers were a little deceiving because a lot of those numbers came on that two-minute drill at the end of the first half where he had like a 20-yard draw play, a nine-yard run when yeah. Washington was kind yeah. of saying, all right, you want to run for eight yards? Go ahead. We don't care. It's a two-minute drill. And I think the key here, too, is that they got to figure out a way to get a chunk play in the run game. We haven't seen a big run in the run game from the Giants in what seems like quite a while where you're getting a 30 or 40-yard pop here or there. And I think... That's the way this Giants team is to score points. Because unless Slayton beats him over the top, which he can, but Washington in that last game played a lot of soft zone, right? They just didn't want to let guys get over the top on them. Benjamin St. Juice might be back, their second yeah. quarterback, so that'll make it a little bit tougher. The Giants just targeted uh, Danny Johnson and uh, the other rookie, Chris Holmes. Uh, what was the other Christian, Christian Holmes. Christian yeah, Holmes, yeah, right? Christian Thank Holmes. you. And Christian they just yeah. they, they just went after those guys, you know, in, in that game. And if St. Juice is back, it's going to be a little harder to do that. So... Um, they have to figure out a way to pop some long runs in this run game, and that's one thing they really have not been able to do in recent weeks. Yeah, they're not, they're not run blocking well at all, John. They're not running the ball at all. And, uh, look, is it <laughs> – who would have thought that? I mean, they actually they actually missed Ben Brennison in a way, no question about it. I mean, who would have thought that? If I would have said that over the summer, hey, you know, Ben Brennison could be a key to this offensive line, but – they really haven't been the same blocking offensive line since Ben went down. So they might get him back. Maybe that'll help. But like I said at the beginning of this podcast, John, everybody has to play better. Everybody has to block better. Everybody has to up their game, you know, because they haven't run block well at all. They haven't run the ball. Saquon, last four games. It, it, look, I know a lot of people want to jump on. All right, Saquon's worn down. It looks like he's shot. Oh, here we go. He's injured. You know, he's, well, he, he doesn't have many holes to run either, John. You look at the film and you're like, okay, they're not moving people off the ball either up front, you know? So it's a combination, of, you know, and they're going to have to just, like, like we just talked about, John, they have to play better. They have to run block better, man. Uh, because if you don't establish your run against these guys, <laughs> forget it, man. You're in a lot of trouble. No, absolutely, Chris. Hey, Giant fans, don't miss out on Giants football at MetLife Stadium this year. We got one game left coming against the Colts on New Year's Day. Uh, go to Giants.com slash tickets to find your game and secure your seat. Limited tickets are still available. And don't forget to go download the Giants official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV. It brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. And Chris, I think this is a good time to kind of transition to big picture stuff. And you talked about the run game. And to me, especially not getting those chunk plays. You know, I went through it in the first seven games. They had six runs of 20 plus yards and, you know, or Saquon had six runs of 20 yeah. plus yards. And in the last seven, they've had two or it was, it was something like that. Right. And you look at the 10 yard runs. He right. had twice as many in the first half of the year than he's had in the second half of the year. So he's just not getting as many big runs. You talked about it. And the other thing too, I think, you know, teams have seen what the giants want to do in the run game a little bit more. And I think they're just much more confident 
in committing more men to it. And, you know, we see the run game, right? It's it's, it's a number and angles game. If you can outnumber your blood, the blockers, if you can get the right angles on some of those outside runs, other teams are not going to be able to run the ball. And I think teams have just said, look, if we're going to stop Saquon Barkley. If Darius Slayton makes a contested deep catch down the field one-on-one, we'll live with that. And I don't think the Giants have been able to do enough to get teams out of that, which I think is what's going to have to happen here right. if this run game is going to look like what it looked like in the first seven games of the year. Yeah, and you know, and you know, John, it's not like Dave's and Kafka haven't tried to again. There's, there's been a couple of games you should have come out throwing the ball. And people are like, oh, what are you doing throwing? You know, you know, trying to get him out of that box. You know, yeah, so they they will try. You know, they, they did. They came over to Seattle game. They came out winging it all over. The, and people, I, even I, was like, whoa, what are you doing here? You know, they come out throwing it. You know, every now so they have tried. And John, look, you talked about it. All these splash plays, all these big chunk yards that Saquon got at the beginning of the year, and, had, and he hasn't had them. And, John, you know, you go back and you look at early in the year, and it's not like, you know, teams didn't have five, six guys up in a box at times, but they were just blocking them, John. They were, you know, they were beating their guys up front. That's changed, man. That's changed. You know, it's, and, and you, know, it's, you know, it's funny because – I was talking with Darius yesterday. I said, Darius, you know, what kind of D, you know? And Darius goes, they play, like you just said, John, they play a lot of soft zone. They yeah. don't do any exotic Washington, but they let their guys, they let their guys up front. Hey, you guys, up, you beast up front. You control up that line of scrimmage. You know, we'll play a little zone. We'll play a little mix it up, a little man, this and that in the back end. But everything we're Washington with Jack Del Rio is up front, you know? And that's something they're going to have to try to establish up front. Of the gym. And it's a tough task. But dude, like you said, they are what they are, John. They're gonna no matter what, even if the six, they're gonna have to try to establish a moment because this offense runs through Saquon that has all year. And it, they're gonna have to continue to do that with Saquon and try to establish that run because they just don't have the personnel to come out and throw it all over the place, man. You know, but we'll see how we'll see how look, it was two weeks ago. We'll see how Kafka and Dable attack this one mm-hmm. Sunday night. You know, I agree. I don't think they blocked it as well either. I think, you know, a lot of the guys coming in and out of the lineup, you mentioned Bredesen, Evan Neal not being there for a few weeks. I think that had an impact too. Um, and I think yeah, we've almost seen that reflected in the way Saquon's running it. I feel like, you know, earlier in the year, we just saw him go and hit the hole a lot. I think he's been a little bit more hesitant now because there hasn't been enough room and the confidence isn't there as much. So, you know, I don't know if this is going to come back together this year, and I do think there's some, you know, familiarity from watching the team on tape over the course of the year. Teams, teams figure out what they're doing. And, you know, I think at some point, Chris, if this team is going to go and make the playoffs, I do think when it comes down to it, the passing game is going to have to step up here and have a drive. I'm not saying you have to, you know, oh, throw absolutely. for 350 and, you know, Daniel's got to complete 70% of his passes and have four touchdowns. But you're going to have to have a couple moments here, whether it's a you know a 60-yard touchdown catch or just a, a big drive at the end of the half or the end of the game where this passing offense is going to have to do something a couple of times a game for the Giants to, to get where they want to go. I, I just think in the modern NFL and the way teams are playing the Giants right now, to do it to try to do it just with the running game is exceedingly difficult unless your defense can really shut down the opponent get some takeaways and help you out. And and that just hasn't been in the cards. And John, look, they've tried that. Let's forget. Let's not forget the end of the Washington game regulation. What does Daves and Kafka do? He throws two verticals. Yeah. Darius has got to come down with that one ball. You know, and, and like you said, a passing game, I said, but hey, look, they have, they have taken some shots. Okay. Now, and they, and they would have taken a few more shots if, if Daniel only has some damn time. Like the play we just talked about with Bradbury. I mean, Isaiah beat him on a double move. Bradbury was toasted. Daniel started looking there, and then Daniel had to step up. He goes down, okay? But they have to – look, it's not like they haven't attempted some sh- – they they are trying with Darius. You know, Darius – let's face it. Darius is the only guy on his team who can get over the top of a defense, okay? And they have. They have, they have attempted to go vertical um, – Look, I got to be honest with you, John, going back to the last wash of the game a couple of weeks ago, they come out and Dave's, they go vertical with Darius. Look, if he comes down with that ball, it's a whole different, we're talking about a whole different thing now. Of course. You know, the Giants are probably going to win that game. And people are going to be like, oh, look, look, they attack down the field. You know what I'm right? 
That second play, John, is what really surprised me. They went vertical again on second down. That's what I have to be honest. Up in the booth, I was like, holy crap, Mike. You're going to talk about Kafka. You know, like, man. So, they have to, look, they take some shots when they could, you know. Um, but it's just not a lot to work with. But, look, nobody understands that more. What you, The point you just made, like, you're going to have to throw the ball. So, they, you know, they have attempted it. They're going to try it. Nobody knows that more than Dave's, man. Dave's is a real – I tell you what, man, John, you want to talk about big picture soon and all that. Dave's is, and Kafka, this Dave's is a real sharp mind, man. You know, he he is no dummy. He knows what's up. Um, and, it, look, I, I expect to see that again this week. I expect to see a couple more shots down the field with Darius. And, you know, it's on film. We all know that. We all know what Isaiah could do. And I expect to see even some double moves with him. Mm. Try to get a little vertical on Washington you know, this week. The key is going to be what, though? The same old story. Can they give Daniel some time up front? Yeah, and and I'll get to Daniel in a second, but I think on the protection thing, one thing that, Chris, not enough people have talked about this week, you know, the protection against Philly was horrible. It might have been there. Besides the Dallas game, you know, the first Dallas game, it was probably the worst pass protection game of the year. Uh, it, you know, Hassan Reddick was living in the back. Yes. It was a nightmare. Uh, the game against Washington was okay. You know, I thought the second half they actually mm-hmm. protected fairly well. You had a covered sack in there. Montez Sweat did nothing in the game. You know, uh, Deron Payne had the sack on Kowinski early on. Jonathan Allen got a little bit pressure late on, on Gates, but I thought for yeah. the most part the offense line did pretty well. But I think the underrated part of all this is that those two games against Philly and Washington, that was in MetLife Stadium. It gets much harder for an offensive line to protect mm-hmm. on the road on a Sunday night when that Washington crowd is going to be going bananas. The offensive line cannot hear. They're going to be a step slow on the snap. So this to me, and I think the interesting dynamic here is that, and um, Feliciano talked about this yesterday a little bit. We know them pretty well, but they know us pretty well, right? The one-on-one defensive line, offensive line matchups. But now you throw in the fact that it's going to be loud and, you know, the offensive linemen are going to be at a bit of a disadvantage with the crowd noise. People haven't talked much about that. I think it's going to be an even tougher task, especially if Chase Young's back. We haven't mentioned that either, right? To protect Daniel in passing situations on Sunday night. Yeah, that's going to be another, you know, that's a good point, John. You know, nobody's really brought that. It's early in the week. Well, it's not really the weekend. It was Thursday, but that's a great point because (laughs) guess what? You're not going to have that crowd with you now, you know? And that could be a big factor in this because they're going to be pretty loud too. I'm sure this is, you know, this is like, look, look let's face it. You no, know, Dable's downtoned it this week. He doesn't want this. Like, Hey, this is a playoff game. You know, it's a big game. We know that, but relax with that playoff talk. You're like, you know, Dable's he stressed to his team this week. Like, okay, guys, guess what? It's not a playoff game. Cause if we lose, we're coming back next week and playing again. Okay. So, but the feel of it, is a playoff type feel. Let's face it. The winner of this game is going to be in the driver's seat for the playoffs. No question about it. They're going to make the playoffs for probably the winner of this game. I don't think, barring some kind of unfor- you know collapse, the winner of this game is going to go to the playoffs. Okay, so it has a playoff type feel. And what? And the, the point I'm making, John, is that yeah, the crowd is going to have that playoff type feel to it, and they're going to have that intensity like it's a playoff game. They're going to be extra loud. So that's going to be another. You know, like you said, that's a great point, John, because. That's going to be a big factor in this one. No question about it. You know, you got a rookie. Look, you got a rookie in Evan Neal, a right tackle. You know, this is probably going to be the first time. Well, maybe the second, you know, but a real loud playoff type feel to it in the building and Evan Neal and all that. Yeah, it might be the, um, you know what, dude, not for nothing, Chris. This might be the first because remember, he he didn't play in that Thanksgiving game yeah. at Dallas. Did he, was right. he healthy for the game at Seattle or is he out of that game? I'm trying to remember. He he missed that game, right? Didn't he get hurt uh, I think against Phillips. I think Phillips. I think Tyree Phillips was playing. Yeah. yeah so he probably. So game. what? The, the biggest game was what? The game in London at Tennessee in Week One. He hasn't had much right. of this. Right. Right. So I mean, so this is going to be his first experience in a visiting building, not not London, a visiting building where it's going to be real loud, you know. So uh, you know, little, little look, little things like that come into play. You know, that's where you get a false start in a big situation, something like that. So so. Uh, that's all factors that play into it. Yeah, no question about it. Um, all right, let's now take a look at, at, at Daniel. And, you know, we talked about the running game a little bit, why we think it's kind of slowed down a bit. You know, this is where I'm at with Daniel, and I think I, he, you interact with the fans as much as I do, either online or with your podcast and stuff like that. And, you know, factions have developed, and I think both factions are, you know, way too extreme in both their positions. 
Because, you know, for me, Chris, and I don't know if you feel this way, if I could, you know, invent the time machine, go back in time and pick up Daniel's fifth year option, I would. And I think that's kind of what you would like to do now in this offseason is, you know, get him on a, a shorter term deal with reasonable money, see what he can do with better weapons around him. Then you can make a long term decision. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I'm at because I think he's done a great job of doing what they've asked him to do. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the production isn't as, you know, high as you would like, but I think that has to do with what's going on around him as much as it more than it does him, to be quite honest with you. And, and that's kind and, and, and that yep. and that's kind of where I am with him, where I think we know a little bit more. I think you're happy with what he's done. Do you know if he's your, you know, quarterback in the next 10 years against that's going to lead you to a Super Bowl? I don't think you're sure about that because you haven't seen that yet. But I think you think maybe he can be that guy. So that's kind of where I'm at right. with, with 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 Daniel long term. And I think that's so going to be a tough tough needle to thread in the off season with how the financials are going to work. But that's kind of where I'm at. And and as usual, it, I'm I'm kind of somewhere in the middle here between the two extremes of the fan base. <laughs> I think we all are, John. You know, it's <laughs> like well, for, you know, I think every, you know, I know a lot of fan base. Oh, he's not the answer, but you know. I think people are f they're forgetting something. A, quarterbacks don't grow on trees. B, you're not getting a top five to seven, ten pick anymore. The Giants have played themselves at it at. You're Joe not even in a top 15 pick. Future. Right. Joe Mortgage is not uh, – Joe Shane is not going to mortgage the future by making some blockbuster trade that trade up and try to get a Bryce Young or, you know, or a Khalid Williams, whatever it might be. That, that's not happening, okay? They didn't pick up the 50-year option. Well, they wanted to see what they had. You know, they – look – John, they like Daniel. When they sat down with John Mara, Abel, and Shane, of course, John asked him, what do you think about my guy? And they both liked him. That's oh, of course, by the way, no. if, if, if I yeah. were them last offseason, I wouldn't have picked up the fifth-year option either. I think at the time it was the right decision. But what can you do? Things change. Right. It's a new regime. They want to see what the hell they had, okay? Mm -hmm. They liked Daniel. They told John, yeah, we, no, we like this kid. But, the, of course, like everything else, you got to see how it works out. Well, guess what, John? Brian Dable's grown to really like Daniel. Okay, he really like Joe Shane really likes him. To me, the feeling is we got to get this kid more weapons. We got to build around him more. Okay, because this kid could win football games for us. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. And it, and you know, oh, it's Chris, look, people come at me all the time, John. Chris, stop with the excuses. It's four years. He still can't do this. He can't do that. Well, I'll tell you what. How many times have they been sacked this year? 44, John? Okay, how many How many sacks has Daniel escaped? 10, 15 more? I mean, come on. Okay, so you're going to have to build around them. Look, do we know, could he lead this team to a Super Bowl? I, I don't know. Maybe, John? But is he is he a tomato? Is he a guy like, oh, John, no question. You got to get rid of this guy. He's not the answer. Absolutely not. And, and listen. Like you just said, you're going to have to work with the numbers. Whatever, if they want to tag them one year, if they want to do a uh, three-year, whatever the hell it's going to be with Josh, that's something they're going to have to work out. But what's the answer, John? Who replaces – everybody – so many people want him. Now gone. you got it. Okay, so okay, so I, a couple of times I go back and forth with people on Twitter in a respectful way, John. Okay, okay, so you want Daniel gone. So answer me this. Who are you replacing him with? Well, we're working on the offseason. No, that's not the answer. Who are you replacing them with? You're not getting a Bryce Young. You're not getting a Khalid Williams. You're not forget about that. The Giants have played themselves out of that position. So who are you replacing them with, John? Oh, maybe Jimmy G. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, you know what I mean? Daniel's going nowhere, in my opinion. I believe they look at this and say, okay, well, we're gonna have to show up the interior of this offensive line. We're gonna have obviously John. We all know this. This isn't rocket science. We're going to have to add receivers. We're going to, we're going to try to get this kid a true number one receiver. A true number one. Which, by the way, is, not, is okay. not going to be easy, by the way, because there are no true number and, ones on the free agent right. market. And frankly, even the wide receivers in this draft, Chris, they would probably be, in last right. year's class, wide receivers like five, six, and seven. Right. So what I mean, look, I'm sorry. Maybe I, I don't want to mislead people. What I mean by true number one is that you have a a good number one. Okay, I don't mean a Terry. You might not. You're not going to probably get a Terry McLaurin. You're not going to get a Justin Jefferson. Don't, I, I don't want to mislead people. What I mean is that you could look at the kid though. No, I hear you. I say, okay, this is our number one. This is our number one guy. And then you have, you know, you have your two. You have your one. Whatever the hell it might be. You got a guy Wandell. You know, Wandell will be back some point next year. 
and all that stuff. You get a good slot guy and all that stuff. Um, that's what I mean by getting weapons around him, you know, because right now he just, he hasn't had the weapons all year. I mean, Darius has developed into a pretty nice, but, but we all know Darius is not a one. He's not even a one A's a two, two B, whatever the hell you might want to call him. Um, so they don't have to get, I think they look at him, John and, and Daniel and say, Hey, we're going to have, we could build around this kid. He has shown us enough that we build around this guy, get him some weapons. This kid can lead us to where we want to go. Is he a Super Bowl winning quote? All that stuff, John. I don't know. I can't give you that answer right now, but I could give you this answer. I could give you this answer. This kick could lead you to the playoffs, and no matter what, the Giants are right there on the cusp of a playoff spot. And how many? You know, are people forgetting that Daniel has five game winning drives this year? Five, John. What is that? You know. So I know people are like, oh, he can't do it. He can't. Do it. Well, he has led this team to come back wins this year. Get the kids some more weapons because I'll ask, and I'll, John, I'll ask everybody that listens to this podcast today. I want you to think about something. I know a lot of people want Daniel gone, bro. Okay, who are you replacing him with? That's that's my question. Yeah, Chris, and you know, I agree with you 100. percent I'm with you, and you know, he's not Davis Mills, right? He's not Marcus Mariota. He's not Mitch Trubisky. He's 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 better than that. And this is not to take anything away from those guys, but those are you know journeyman quarterbacks that team sign when they need a really good backup or a stopgap starter. I think he's shown he's more than that. Now, do I think he's ever going to be Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes or Justin Herbert or or someone like that? Probably not. You know, could I be wrong? Sure. But I think, you know, so you yep. take the bottom tier out, you take the top tier out, and then, you know, now we're cutting. So how high can he get? Is he, if he gets put in a better situation, can be can he be as good as Dak Prescott? Can he get to Kirk Cousins level? You know, can you can he get there? Sure, maybe. Or maybe he's more like a, a Garoppolo type. Maybe he's more like a, a Mac Jones type, right? Someone like that. I don't know. You know, I don't know where in those middle tiers he's going to wind up when all is said and done. But if you're a fan that says, look, I, the only quarterback I want to invest in long term is a top five guy that's going to be a, you know, super duper star. That's fine. Good luck waiting to get that guy because it's going to be really, really hard. And, you know, you can win with a guy in a lower tier. It's just a matter of where he kind of sits there and how you build around him. And I think that's going to be the trick here. Right, Chris, because, you know, and this is kind of another big picture question in terms of team building the off season, how do you retain the guys you like on this roster over the next two years? And we've talked about this before on, on, on the huddle and on big blue kickoff live, right? Over the next two years, right. I'm going to list you the guys that are going to be free agents. Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, Darius Slayton, uh, Andrew Thomas, Julian Love, Xavier McKinney, Leonard Williams, Adoree Jackson, Dexter Lawrence, I've literally just listed all of the best players on this team. Like literally all the, you look at the top 10 players on this team. They're all going to be free agents in the next two years. That's just the way it's structured. So how do you make these decisions of who you bring back? Because you like some of these guys, but also don't get your cap in a spot where you can't add to this core to take that next step to become better. You know what I mean? I, I think it's going to be right. a real tough decision sure. for Joe Shane who to bring back, who not to, how do you manage the cap Real tough. and in terms of building where you, and, and, and to kind of get where you want to go. Right. Absolutely. John. And you, look, what's the priority positions of those free agencies? Well, it's left tackle and quarterback. I'm sorry. I, and I know I love Saquon. They'll get me, but running back is not a priority position in re-signing. I'm sorry. Okay. Left tackle is Andrew is going to have to be extended. We'll see what they do with him. You know, they, they still have some time to play with him. But we'll see what Joe wants. If Joe, I can see Joe extending him this offseason. Oh, absolutely. The first few years. Definitely. Now, we all love Julian Love. We, no pun intended. We love him. I love him. Yeah. He does so much. But is he a priority free agent signing? Probably not. Okay. Daniel Jones, he's a quarterback. He's a priority. If they like him, if which we I think we both agree, John, that Joe and Brian Daves like him. Like him a lot, okay? They think there's something there. That. What what that something is, they're not sure, but yeah. there's something there that they want to explore. There's, there's something there that Dave's has kind of really liked, okay? I know that. I think you know that for a fact. I think I know that for a fact. You know, people whisper. We all talk. But, you know, I, you know, when, I think Dave's has grown a, an immense respect for Daniel over the course of this season, and there's something there that Dave's really likes. I think that's fair to say, right, John? Um 
So you look at the free agency. Well, well, Chris, well, tell me, Chris, what's going to have to get done? Well, Andrew Thomas is going to get done. There's no question about that. None. Okay. He's going to get extended probably this off season. If not, they'll work on it in, four, in year four. Okay. Whatever down the road, but he's going nowhere. Daniel Jones, that's going to be, what does Joe do with Daniel Jones? Number wise, year wise. Did he, did he throw the tag on a la Kirk Cousins over the years? Do they do that? We'll find out. You know, I can't give it any answer right now. You know, uh, now, the big question is going to be, John, I'm going to put you on the spot right here. You're, you're GM, John Schmelz. It's right my now. job to put you on the spot. That's not how this works. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to do a quick, uh, uh, you know what? Let's share the GM hat. Me and you, All right. John. Let's share it. What are we doing with Saquon Barkley? That's going to be the million-dollar question. Or in this case, $15 million question, or 16 or 14. What do we do with Saquon? Okay. So, look, if you, you could only tag one guy, we'll see which way they go with that. If they work on it extension with Daniels, you could tag Saquon. But John, look, this is my opinion and my opinion only. I'm not giving a running back 15, 16 million dollars a year. I'm not I, doing it. I'd be okay with them playing on the tag next year, but what I I think the, the, I think the Christian McCaffrey or Ezekiel Elliott style contract gets very dangerous very quickly. Well then we're we're in agreement. Me and John, we shared the GM hat and me and you I guess we're co- <laughs> if we were up in that office, John, we would be like sitting there drinking coffee saying, yeah, Chris, yeah, Biz, uh, we're not giving Saquon $15 million a year. No, we're not doing that, John. You know, so that's going to be, you know, look, if, like, like I just said, if they give Daniel, if they work on a thing with Daniel as far as extension, three, four, whatever it might be, um, then I have no problem tagging 26. No, no problem at all. I, look, we all love, we all know, all right? But there's no way, John, I'm sorry, there's no way I'm giving a running back in today's NFL 15, 16 million. You, I think we've all seen what's happened with the Zeke contract. I think we've all seen what's happened with Christian McCaffrey. Not, and I'm not saying they're not still pretty good players, especially right. McCaffrey. I'm not saying that, but it's a very dangerous move, you know, because you know why, too, John? This team has a lot of holes and they're going to have a little money to play with in free agency this year. Joe's going to have some money to play with, something they didn't have last offseason. And they have to fill some holes because. This team has plenty of holes still. They have to they have to show up a lot of positions. So. Yeah, and of course, I think too. I think you know if you can maybe do if you want to pay him like fifteen million, you know, for two years or something like that. I don't think that's something Saquon would agree to, um, because you know running backs want to get that long term deal in. And if there's an, you can set up a contract where there's an easy out after a year or two for the Giants, sure. But again, I think something like that'll be will be kind of tough to tough to negotiate with you know both sides agreeing to something like that. And I think. One thing we've seen this year, just in terms of the running back, and again, this is taking nothing away from Saquon Barkley. He's been great this year, and this has nothing to do with him. But a running back is very dependent, more so than other positions, of what's going on around him, right? You can have a great running back. If the line's not blocking, Mm -hmm. it's not going to work. If the other team is putting too many guys up in the box, it's not going to work. And I just think that that position specifically is very dependent on the other things going on around him. And if you invest too much money in that position, it's hard to build up what's going on around him. So I think that's kind of the the formula you have to figure out here in terms of finding that balance where you want him back, you love him, you think he helps the team. Let's be honest, he's their most he's their best offensive player. I mean, I don't think either one of us would disagree with yeah, that. He's sure. their best offensive player, except for maybe Andrew Thomas. He's their best <laughs> absolutely be- best offensive player. So you want to figure out a way to make it work, but it, you know, just the 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 team building and, and financial a- aspects of it are something that's that I think going to be tough. John, I mean, look how many positions they're going to have to address between the draft and free agency. You need mm-hmm. a corner. You need linebacker. You, John, you need inside back. It's bad. Okay, I think you know we're good on the edge. Don't get me wrong. We got the dynamic duo. Well, hopefully, the potential dynamic duo of Tibbs and Aziz. Okay, uh, but we need inside back. Is bad. Okay. We need a corner, bad. We need interior offensive linemen, pretty bad, okay? We're going to have to address all those things via draft and free agency. And you just, I'm sorry, Saquon, and I love Saquon, we all, but, you know, a running back. And look, is Saquon going to want those type of numbers? Of course he is, John, you know. And so would I if I were him, too. Well, I, he, he deserves it. Absolutely. It, it's a business. It's a business. And that's what he's going to do. And that's him and his agent are going to sit down and go, this is the number. We're going to look at McCaffrey's contract. We're going to look at Zeke, whatever it might be, and go, okay, this is where we're going to shoot. This is where we're going to start off. And I don't blame him. This is a business, brother. I get it. You know, but that, you know, but on the other side, it, what I mean by it, it's a business that it's also a business for Joe Shane 
Brian Dable and everybody else as far as, well, we're not going to go to this number as a running back or we're going to do this and all that. And so it, it'll be interesting to see, but would it shock me if this is 26 is last year with the Giants? No, it, it wouldn't, you know, but we'll see how that plays out. They, they love Saquon. Of course they want him back, but it always comes down to numbers and what, you know, what, what's best for this football team because there's a lot of positions they still need to address. All right, let, let, you, you mentioned the defense, the type of additions they have to make, Chris. How do you view the defense this year? As you mentioned, Wink's done a good job, and I think a lot of it's been with smoke and mirrors, you know, really good situational play. You mentioned yeah. it, the, the red zone defense, the third down defense, and it's really obscured, yeah. I think. You know, if you look at the overall yardage marks, I mean, they're they're pretty brutal. I mean, they're not good. I think now they're 26th or 27th in yards allowed per game, uh, things like that. I can I got the numbers right in front of me here. I can bring it up. And yeah, they're 26. They're 20. They're 26 in D. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, this is against the schedule where they played a team like the Texans. They played a team like the Panthers. They played a team like the Bears before they got going. They got Cooper Cup. You know, the Packers aren't a good offensive team this year. Even the Ravens aren't a very good offensive team. Washington isn't a you know team that scores a lot of points. So, you know, they've done it without playing a lot of elite elite offenses and quarterbacks over the course of the year. You know, I just wonder how you look at this defense when you get to the end of the year and how much it needs to be rebuilt, um, how much work you have to do, and, and just kind of how you view how this season is, has kind of flowed for that side of the ball. Yeah, I, I think Winky's performed magic, John. I, I really do, man. I mean, what he's done with this personnel, you know, uh, look, the keys we talked about earlier has been the red zone and third down. I mean, if that if that wasn't good, then this team would be – Right now, it'll be five seven instead of seven five. One, it'll probably be four, you know, nine or whatever the hell. Up. Yeah, four nine, four eight, one, whatever the hell we don't look at it, you know. So, uh, he's now, I think he squeezed everything he could out of these guys. No, I really do. And look, they've given up 400 plus yards the last three games, they've given up a ton of rushing yards, you know. Um, so is it kind of like okay, now it's rising to the top, this is what it's going to be the rest of the year? It's possible. You know, because there isn't a lot of talent. Let's face it. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you look at 2023, you want to look a big picture a little bit, John. You know, they're good on the edge, which is key in the NFL. You want to have some edge guys. No quite. You got to get guys that get the quarterback. Okay, so it looks like, obviously, they're good there. On the interior, Leo, Dex. Dex is having a Pro Bowl type year. Okay, but linebackers is something that, look, Wink hasn't been crazy about this inside linebacker group from day one. Okay. From day one, Wink hasn't been crazy about this. So take Crowders of the world, even Micah McFadden, you know, he's been in the mix. Jalen's played better since they put him in that Mike spot. I thought probably his, the last game was probably might've, might've been his best game as this year, Jalen against the Cowboys last game. Um, but he still does a ton of things where you just shake your head. Linebackers, John is a priority. You're going to have to you know address that position. And, you know, obviously McKinney coming back and Corn is, you know, they're going to have to address it because how I look at it is that Wink has performed magic. Wink's schemes have been so huge in some of the things they've done this year. Um, and you know what? They've gotten a few turnovers. They're plus two and whatever turnovers they haven't. The offense hasn't turned over a whole lot, which, you know, which has been you know, for Daniel. That's great for Daniel and the offense. Um, but have they screwed? Have they reached their – Epic, you know, the, the, the top ceiling this year. And now it's just going to be giving up those 400 plus every game for the last, you know, four games, all that. I could see that too, John. So uh, it's a position, it's defense that, and, and let's face it too, John, you know, you, you might not even have Wink next year. Wink might be gone for, you know, you know, Wink's, Wink wants to be a head coach. You know, Don't so go depressing the fan here. base, Chris. What are you doing here? Come on. I know. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. But to me and John, though, we're in a building. We know that Wink wants to be a head coach. He wants, you know, so he might even be here next year. So um, and with, and me and John, I, we, right now we're talking about big picture 2023. So, um, yeah, that's some, it's, they're going to have to show up a lot on his defense, man, because you, I think they maybe they've got Wink has gotten everything he's got out of this unit. And I don't know. I don't know if he's going to get much more moving forward. All right. Two final questions, Chris. This is kind of a last yeah. big picture one. How do you view this season? Like, like, let's say the Giants finish, you know, uh, eight, eight and one or nine, seven and one. They get in as the right. seventh seed, right? They lose in the first round of the playoffs. 
you know, do you will come out of the season saying, yeah, right. this was like, you know, this was a 500 team, or do you say, ah, maybe they outperform their town a little bit and they're maybe not as good as what the record might indicate. And that might indicate, you know, you have to make some tougher yeah. decisions in the off season. You know, how do you just view this season and what it means in, in, in terms of the larger kind of big picture stuff we've been talking about? Yeah, I view it no matter what happens moving forward, John, I had this as like a six win team going in. So I view this as I tell you what, everybody, you're in good hands with Brian Dable, Mike Kafka, and his coaching staff, and Joe Shane, obviously. You're, you're in good hands with these guys. Because, John, there is no way, in my opinion, this team should be competing for a playoff spot. I mean, they, if they win Sunday night, they're 8, 5, and 1. And with this personnel, John, there is no way they should be 8, 5, and 1. I'm sorry. So I view it as just an incredible job by his coaching staff. And I've obviously a credit to the players to how they've played, but it's just been more than we could have imagined, John. I mean, if anybody's going to tell you last August, as we were standing on the sidelines doing training camp in 90 degree weather, sweating out, you know, a lot off. <laughs> and somebody walked up to me and says, Hey, Chris, uh, let me tell you something. Uh, I got this team as a nine-win team, ten-win. We're, go we're going to the playoffs. I would have said, dude, do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. Go get a drink. Go get some ice water on the side. And go cool off because you're losing <laughs> your mind. Okay? All right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, Chris, by the way, that, that sounded like me talking to the Tino every day during training camp. So that makes about sense. I don't even think. <laughs> no, he didn't. He actually did it. He did came it. up he to did me. It. No. And, or, in all fairness to Paul, as we all know, could be a little, uh, you know, what's the right word I'm going to use? <laughs> could be a little shaded, a little... Frantic? frantic. You know, we How about both, frantic? We, we all, we, he could be a little uh, crazy, Paul. We both know him well. You know him better than me, bro. You're with him every day. I see him a lot, but we all know him. Even Paul didn't come off to me over the summer and say, no. hey, Chris, I think this is a playoff team. I, I would have been like, Paul, stop. Get out of here. Get away from me. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so hey, it's just, it's, it's been a... John... Did we think we were going to have meaningful football games in December in training camp? No, but here we are, meaningful football games. I think to everybody, it's such it's such kudos to this coaching staff, John, uh, Brian Dable, Kafka, Wink, everybody, Jerome Henderson, who's one of the best in the business, trying to piece, you know, trying to tie pieces together like he did last year, John. You know, and, and, and he's just doing it. Great. Look, they haven't given up a lot of big plays, dude, down the field. No. Okay. Just doing a great job. Um, so the biggest thing I get out of this is that, hey, we, this organization, is with these guys from Joe down, Brandon Brown, who he, he might be one and done. I mean, you don't know what brand from Brandon Brown, Joe Shane, Dable, Kafka, everybody. Um, what they've done with this personnel, John, to be playing to, to me and you being on a podcast on your podcast saying, Hey, Chris, this is like a playoff tight game, December 12th. You know, that's incredible right there. I think that speaks right there for everything right there, dude. All right, let's wrap this up, Chris. What do you think is going to happen Sunday night? I'm putting you on the spot now. Okay. You put me on a spot. I don't blame it. This is your show. <laughs> uh, uh, you're probably not going to like what I'm going to say, but. I think the crowd, like you said, I thought that was a great point by you. This is a different story now. You're playing in a visiting ballpark. Um, look, Chase Young's, not, you know, he's not, he's going to be an added piece. He's not going to, you know, I don't think he's going to play more than 30 plays, but he's going to be another added quality piece to a ready quality defensive line. Um, I don't like the way the Giants are stopping the run. I think, the, I think Washington will do enough to win a close one, John, Sunday night in like a 17-13 type game. All right, I'm going the other Unfortunately. way. And I, I'm, I'm always one to, 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 to be cautious here. And I think, they've, I think the glass slipper falls off Taylor Heineke in this game. I think it's been coming. I think he's going to throw the ball to the Giants a couple times. And I think that's going to be the difference. Now, if they cannot break the glass slipper and you know the turnover ratio is even at the end of the game, I think it would probably look right. more like the game you're talking about. So I think... To me, that, that's what this is all about. Can you know the one spot where I think the Giants have a distinct advantage in this matchup, Chris, is the quarterback spot. So I think Daniel Jones has to outplay Heineke. And that doesn't mean the numbers at the end of the game will reflect that because Heineke has better weapons, right? 
But I think right. Jones right. has to outplay Heineke significantly in this game if the Giants are going to win because you talk about Washington's weapons, you talk about the pass rush, blah, 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 blah. Then it starts turning the other way. So I think the Giants have to turn over Heineke. That's how they're going to win this game. Yeah, look, if they're, look, John, if they're plus two in turnovers, Giants will probably win this game, like you said. If they're plus two in turnovers, they're going to win this game. And I think that's one of the keys to winning this game, obviously, is going to be that plus one or two. And like you said, getting a couple of Taylor. You know what I mean? Getting a couple of Taylor because he will give you those opportunities. There's no question about it. So uh, if they do that, hey, John, if they if they get a couple of picks, a couple of recovery, whatever, one pick, one recovery, two plus two, they're probably going to win that close one like you just said. I agree. I just don't – I don't quite see it going that way. That's just my opinion. I, I think it's going to be another tough one. Um, but I think this time Washington's going to come out on top. But we'll see. Hopefully I'm wrong. All right, Chris, tell the folks where they can find all your stuff in Giants Insider. Yeah, you can follow Twitter at Giant Insider. And you can subscribe to the Giant Insider newspaper at GiantInsider.com. And, John, it was a pleasure to be on. Thank you for having me on. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll do it again in the future. And um, hopefully we come out on top Sunday night, primetime. Hey, John, what are they, 0 for last 11 in primetime I games have... or 10? It's I haven't counted. So but do, bro. It's did, been a while. Did, did. It's been it a has. while, bro. And, and by the way, the podcast, you can find that on any podcast platform, your podcast? Any 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 podcast platform, Giant Insider uh, Podcast. Yes, thank you, John, for reminding nah, me that. No problem. Make sure you check it out. Chris, we appreciate the time, dude. Good to talk to you, as always. The Giant Soto Podcast was brought to you by PSE&G. Energy efficiency for game time and anytime. Visit pseg.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. Thanks for joining us on the Giant Soto Podcast. We'll see you next time.